Amen. You know, when the preacher wants to preach about the Trinity, he doesn't hear the end of the song. Uh, but thank you. Good morning today. Good morning. Happy Holy Trinity. Amen. It's a great pleasure to see you all joining us here physically, but we are also delighted to connect with our online community. Just to mention uh, locally here, we are happy to connect with Masi from Kayole, with Chris from Isiolo, and our dear sister internationally, Masi Senorita from the U.S., and our brother Munyiri from Doha, and many of you who are scattered across Kenya, across East Africa, and across the world, connecting with us uh, from this uh, church as we bring God's word. We reflect today on the Holy Trinity, and I will attempt to explain what the Holy Trinity is, establish uh, some biblical uh, references to the Trinity, and then I'll explain how uh, the Godhead works, and then we'll transit to some understanding of what that means to us personally. So I'll give a little bit of uh, teaching, which is important for us, um, especially from a knowledge perspective, which will apply in our heart. So what is Trinity? Trinity is a Christian doctrine that uh, explains uh, God as one who makes himself known in three persons. That's the simplest explanation of Trinity. God who is one, yet makes himself known in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Meaning, we do not worship three gods, but we worship one God who manifests himself in three different forms. Very simple explanation there. So, is Trinity really biblical? I'm afraid to say that the word Trinity does not appear in Scripture uh, as it were. However, Scripture explains and gives implicit uh, references to Trinity in many places. First, in our Old Testament reading, in Isaiah 6 verse 3, you had the formula, holy, 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 which is echoed in Revelation chapter 4 verse 8, holy, holy, holy. That is a Trinitarian formula, having an implicit and underlying, a concealed reference to God who manifests himself in three persons. But we also see it in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where Jesus commissions his disciples and tells them, go, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You see it elsewhere, even in uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, in the grace that we share, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And in many, many other places, the Trinity is referred to implicitly, if not explicitly. Now, uh, how, how does the Godhead, Trinity is also referred to as the Godhead, uh, how does the Godhead, how does the Trinity, the three persons in one, uh, relate to each other? So, real quick, number one, for us to understand that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, I make the following uh, explanations. Number one, the Son is equal to the Father, and He is God, the, the Son is is God as much as he is equal to the Father. In, I only give one reference there. In Thomas, in, um, in, in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 28, Jesus says, in reference to Thomas, he says, Thomas, my Lord and my God. Talking to Thomas, and he refers to Jesus as my Lord and my God. That is Thomas, my Lord and my God. Meaning Jesus is both Lord and both God. There are other references where Jesus is directly referred to as God. But apart from Jesus being God in such a reference, secondly, 
to confirm that Jesus is equal to the Father and is God, he pre-existed with the Father. Uh, in uh, classical gospel, uh, uh, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So meaning, Jesus pre-existed, he is God, but he also was with God even before the declarations that we see in the New Testament where, uh, where Mary conceives and gives birth to him. So the simple fact that he was there at the very beginning qualifies him to be God. But then the Holy Spirit, how then does the Holy Spirit fit into this? The Holy Spirit equally is God. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4, you remember the story of Ananias. When Peter rebukes uh, Sapphira and Ananias, he tells them in Acts 5, 3 to 4, that Satan has filled your heart, that you have lied to the Holy Spirit. So meaning the Holy Spirit is a person. And that Holy Spirit is God. He's part of the Godhead. If you can lie to him, it means he's alive. He's a person. So the Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, Jesus Christ, who is the Son, is a person. And God the Father is a person. And the three are connected uh, together. How do they work together then? The triune Godhead, the three persons who form uh, 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 the Trinity. One, as we see in the creation story in Genesis chapter 1, that the Holy Spirit is present at creation, and in verse 2, he's hovering over the waters. So the Holy Spirit aids in the establishment of creation. He was present and is hovering. But also in Genesis chapter, one, uh, chapter 2, um, verse, chapter 1, verse 26, I beg your pardon, he says, let us, let us, God says, let us create man in our image. Who is the us there? So the us includes God the Father and God the Holy Spirit who is hovering over the earth, but present with them is God the Son. Do I convince you that God the Son is present there? In Hebrews chapter uh, 1, verse 10, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, referring to Jesus, that with your own hands, you establish the foundations of the earth. Meaning at creation, the three are working together. So the Godhead is present at creation, works together, and we see him all through. But then secondly, how we see him working together is in our gospel reading. In uh, John chapter 3, verse 1 to 17, in that gospel reading, we see in verse 16 that God the Father loves the world. He loves the world, for God so loved the world. God the Father loves the world. But we also see that God the Father sends God the Son in that text to come and redeem humanity. Uh, so God the Son comes to carry out the dying on the cross, which leads to redeeming and forgiveness of humanity. But then we also see God the Holy Spirit right at work there. In uh, chapter 3, verse 6, uh, uh, Nicodemus is told, uh, that he must be born of the Spirit. Anyone who is born of the Spirit is born again. So there is the Holy Spirit that gives the rebirth. In verse 8, he's referred to as the wind. So the wind, who is the Holy Spirit, then is involved in that redemption that the Son carries out. He is orchestrating the rebirth. He's orchestrating the newness from inside. So God loves the world. The Son comes to redeem, then the Holy Spirit then works out the creation of a new person uh, inside of us. What are the lessons then after that teaching that we take away with us from Trinity Sunday? Lesson number one, Trinity, uh, the doctrine of Trinity then teaches us a deeper understanding of relationships and a community that is necessary for smooth operation of our lives as believers, that we are a community that is made of individuals. The same way the Godhead is a community of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who work harmoniously without competition, 
without undermining each other, but each plays a critical role in the accomplishing of what God intends. It therefore means that you and I are part of the community of believers that we should not compete, but we should complement each other to accomplish what God intends. It therefore means if you're a preacher like myself, it is not in our place to compete who preaches better than the other, but it is in my position to preach well that God's people may be edified. If you're a chorister like these wonderful uh, brothers and sisters, it is not in the interest of God's kingdom who sings soprano better, who is the better tenor, but that the, all the voices are represented and bring out a harmonious melody that brings glory and honor to God the Father. And in all our spaces, we are meant not to compete, to undermine each other, but to complement one another. So I, wonder, I want to ask, out of this Trinity lesson, are you committing to tone down, if there were, any excesses of wanting to push others away that you alone may shine, but recognizing and appreciating the gifts of everyone so that together we may shine and fill the earth with the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now lesson number one, we are being sent out by the lesson from Trinity to appreciate each other as a community and complement one another. Lesson number two, is that Trinity reminds us that God the Father loves us so much that he sent God the Son to save us from our sins, but that the whole, God the Holy Spirit is available to continuously work in us, making us a better people, that you may not be better today, that there are little weaknesses, mistakes, and things that we commit but God the Father loves us so much that he will not condemn us, as he says in verse 17 of John 3, that he did not come in the world to condemn the world, but that the world may be saved through him. So that God the Father's interest is the salvation and the thriving of yourself as a believer. And so God the Son has accomplished that by dying for you on the cross and for me on the cross, and therefore just need to accept that and choose to live therein. Then God the Holy Spirit is available to empower me to live victoriously. It reminds me of my life as a, a young boy in the villages by the shores of Lake Victoria, growing up, and how fearful we were of the witch doctors who were around in the village. Many times they would pour things on the road to witch people. They would plant charms everywhere. So as you walk around, you're so scared because they will bewitch you and convert you into a mad person and completely ruin your place uh, as a human being. So we lived and grew up uh, surrounded by all these people and all that fear. But as an 18-year-old boy, I made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I discovered that God is so powerful than the witches and the charms that are planted that seek to destroy our lives. Today, I realize that I thrive in the victory of the Godhead. So the Godhead is deployed to be around us. So no matter the weapons thrown at you, set up against you, the Godhead is available. Imagine God the Father is with you. Imagine God the Son is with you. And imagine God the Holy Spirit is with you. Who is it that can stand against you? No one. No one. Even the elders who say that you must face Mount Kenya for you to be blessed cannot stand against you because your blessings come from God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As a widow, not even the elders who say that you must be inherited for you to be blessed. No. You may choose to remarry, but your blessing and protection as a family comes from the triune God. May Jesus Christ, may the Holy Spirit, and may God the Father combined give us a buffer that as we live this life, we may live it so victoriously that the devil will not have the last word in our lives. And I share this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.